All right. Yes. Let's see what we can do here. Um, our topic this evening, it's, it's got a bit of a technical, uh, uh, technical title to it, but it'll all make sense in a second. We're going to be looking at something called paraliturgical practices, things that are, we don't normally think of as the liturgy. Um, uh, other practices that Christians have done through the centuries and still do that we wouldn't describe as church worship or liturgical worship, some other form of it that we, we would uh, be able to explain it in this way. So what's the difference between liturgy or worship and devotional practice? Uh, can we engage in liturgy if we're on our own? Or does a liturgy always assume the presence of other people? Do we have to be in church for a liturgy? Or can we do liturgy outside church? And what about those things that look like liturgies that take place outside churches, like processions, say, or pilgrimages, uh, or house blessings? Uh, here's a, one, that procession here. Is this a liturgy? Or is it just a group of people getting together to, I don't know, enjoy a, enjoy a walk with a statue? Uh, what part of this is liturgical practice and what part of it isn't? Here is a pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela. Is this a liturgical act, pilgrimage in and of itself? Uh, how about a house blessing? Is a house blessing a liturgy? Uh, because it takes place in a house and you've got uh, somebody presiding at it and there are various liturgical looking bits and pieces around like water and, and candles and sometimes incense. Uh, this is a liturgy that's taking place not in a church but in somebody's home. And this is, these are really important questions to ask just at the moment when most of us are doing uh, a liturgy at home uh, rather than uh, in church or in the, pres in the physical presence uh, of other people. Most of us are doing liturgy in front of a screen, uh, rather like this, as you can see. Uh, if you look it up now, there's lots of pictures of this sort on the internet. It's become a real sort of uh, popular search item, uh, I think. Now, we're not the first people, the first Christians to experience this. Christians have felt this sort of tension between what we call liturgy and what we call devotions in every age and in every time. And looking back through Christian history, you can see that liturgy and what we call devotion have tended to sort of develop separately from one another. They haven't really developed in tandem. When we looked at Christian spirituality, uh, we saw this tendency in all Christian denominations. So in Celtic Christianity, we saw it, uh, it develop, happening in the use of the labyrinth, say. Is that a liturgy? No, not really. It takes place in a church here in Chartres. Uh, it's more like an act of devotion that takes place uh, in, in a church. These people are going through it separately on their own. Uh, in Roman Catholicism, we saw it happening in the development of the use of the rosary, for instance. There are specific prayers to say and an order to say them in, but is it liturgy or is it a private devotion that people follow uh, on their own? You can do rosary hour with a group of other people, I suppose, uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a way of praying that's been developed more as a devotional exercise than a liturgical exercise of all the people of God working together. At the bottom there, you can see the Stations of the Cross. Once again, we'll look at these, some of these things in a little bit more detail in a minute. There are um, uh, words to be said at each station. You can do them on your own. You can follow them online if you want to by looking up different pictures uh, and praying with them in your, in your own particular way. Is it a liturgy when it's done on your own? Is it more of a liturgy when it's done with a group of people with responses and singing between each bit of it? So it's not just happening here in these traditional things that we might associate more with Roman Catholicism than Protestantism. It also happens in Protestantism too. Uh, people have a daily quiet time, as it's called, 
where people might have a list of people to pray for, or they might have certain prayers that they go back to frequently. Time alone with God, they might call it, uh, or quiet time, as we were brought up uh, to call it uh, at a certain point in my evangelical evolution. So um, Bible readings, popular hymns that people might sing to themselves, all of these things, they express themselves in Protestantism uh, as well as in Catholicism too. Um, one of the things that we discovered when we looked at liturgical developments in the late medieval period, uh, say, was that um, the main action of the liturgy gradually started to remove itself from the people. So the altar moved right up to the east end of the church and it was separated from the mass of people by these curtains as you can see here with these people peering over. I believe I've shown you this picture before. I like this one on the left because here the priest is doing his business and we've got some rather sad looking layperson here uh, turning away from the altar altogether as if to say, you know, I'm doing my thing and you're doing yours, uh, which was more or less the feeling of some of these masses that were celebrated in the late medieval, uh, in the late medieval period. Um, uh, it, 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 not only that, the Mass was in Latin, so people couldn't really understand it anymore, and also the priest was instructed to conduct quite a lot of it very quietly and under his breath. So even if you were close enough to be able to hear and you were able to understand the Latin, you might not have been able to hear what the priest was actually saying. So the liturgy, as the liturgy became this sort of specialised field that was reserved for monks and nuns and priests, ordinary people ended up having to find devotional practice that fulfilled their needs, because it, it left a gap in people's lives, rather. So, uh, I think I've got a picture of a rood screen here. These rood screens came to uh, uh, come between the altar and the people. Here's a surviving one uh, from a church in East Anglia in England. And you can see on the far side here, uh, you've got the altar. You would be sitting on this side of things uh, and separated by this rood screen. It was called a rood screen because it had a cross on the top of it. Uh, and very often these panels here that are now empty were, would have been filled with other paintings, other statues and things that would even further inhibit your view of what was going on at the top end here at the altar. So you were left to your own devices in the nave of the church, uh, and if you popped into the church, you would probably have to have recourse to your own private devotions at that point, uh, because you weren't really invited to take part uh, in what was going on up at the high altar. So this has a very interesting consequence, and that is the emotions the fervent prayers of the people who are th our side, this side of that rood screen, develop along private lines. And slowly, the liturgy itself, as it becomes very technical and separated from the people, gets drained of all of this emotional content. So the emotion here is being felt more at this side of the screen with people doing their private devotions perhaps sometimes wandering in and out of what the priest is doing, especially at the elevation and the ringing of the bells and uh, the, um, uh, the moment of consecration. Uh, perhaps they're emotionally engaged at that point, but for the rest of the time, their emotions are engaged in their own private devotions that are taking place in a church. So here is an answer to one of the questions that we asked at the beginning. Just because something takes place in a church doesn't mean it's automatically a liturgy. It can be a private devotion. And here, perhaps that's what happens even today when we meet together in churches or when we used to meet together in person. Uh, I don't know what you're all thinking about. Maybe you've got your own private prayers and they're nothing to do with what's happening at the front, uh, especially during the sermon, say, when people's minds tend to wander in the best of circumstances. Uh, so this division between liturgy and devotion perhaps isn't quite as sharp as we have been led to believe. Now, we can see that this wasn't the case in some churches. Here we have an Eastern Orthodox church. 
uh, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, there's lots going on up here at the front. In fact, people are receiving communion. Can you see here? The priest has got a spoon in his hand uh, by which uh, the, the, the wine is administered to the people. But looking out here, you can see people doing various different things. They're not necessarily facing the altar at the moment. They're wandering around lighting candles or maybe even talking to their neighbors sometimes. In, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, people are more free to move around. Perhaps this is especially the case here in this service because it's a Palm Sunday service that gives itself to a lot of moving movement in the sanctuary uh, itself. It's one of the most um, sort of procession-filled, movement-filled uh, services of the year. Um, we're going to look then very briefly at some of these devotional practices uh, that originated in the late medieval period and the early Reformation in a response to this, this liturgy in the church is becoming increasingly remote and increasingly technical. So what we're going to be looking at applies both to the Roman Catholic Church and to the churches of the Reformation. The Reformation, as we know, very much posed a challenge to people's conformity to religious tradition. The Reformers challenged these devotional practices that they thought were suspicious. Things like uh, uh, the devotion to the Blessed Sacrament, say, uh, or lighting candles in front of statues, uh, uh, having a particular veneration for paintings and what have you. The reformers didn't like this and they, they sort of banished it. Uh, but the Roman Catholic Counter-Reformation, as we discovered last year, also banished anything that they thought looked too much like folk tradition. And they cleaned up what they thought was the clutter of the mass. And so the mass for the Counter-Reformation became more technical and devoid of spontaneous devotional content. A, a sort of celebrationary liturgy uh, was turned into a nice tidy thing. Uh, and, and sort of uh, stripped of some of the things that we would associate with medieval uh, devotion. So um, here you have one of those Baroque altars that's all set up to be a public spectacle uh, that where your private devotion or private emotional engagement with what's going on uh, is sort of limited somewhat by the staging of the whole business. Also, as Joris mentioned last week, both Catholics and Protestants, they weren't really arguing about liturgy or private devotion to a certain extent. They might have fixed on liturgy and private devotion uh, as a subject, but what really interested them was something that was a little bit more dry and academic. There were abstract questions about faith. How do you get saved? Uh, how do you, do, do, how, what's the relationship between good works and faith? These, these questions don't really have much to do with liturgy on the surface of it. Uh, they can, they're rather academic. And as Joris pointed out, they, these people were arguing in universities and, and colleges and what have you. And very little affected the private uh, or, or even public worship of, of, of the devotees. So all of these dry arguments, here they are, Luther triumphant, you can see he's waving his books here, sola fide, I think it says in there, uh, and here's Pope Leo X with his papal keys. But notice the thing about this picture. At first it looks very polemical, but look what they're all doing. They're writing, they're writing, there's books all over the place. This is not about liturgy, it's about arguing in tracts and broadsheets and papers. So in the end, for both Protestants and Catholics, they were left in this state of uncertainty about their salvation, and it completely rudderless, completely without guidance when it came to express that faith in liturgical devotion. Does that make sense, Yeah, it makes Joris? totally sense. And that's interesting because you also see in this um, image, there's a procession, you see? Um, and processions were also part of um, the Reformation on the Catholic side, so that it's interesting to see that there there are some form of like communal liturgical communal devotional practices that can be carried out of the sanctuary, which are not liturgy, but that were that became very popular also to 
um, to uh, spread ideas, to make a, a statement about the city. So like in, in Paris, for instance, during the Wars of Religion, you had all groups of people, the Ligueur, who would gather together to have like religious processions that were uh, affirming Catholicity against the Protestants. So like it's mm -hmm. also the beginning of the concept of protest mm -hmm. that comes from mm -hmm. these uh, uh, processions, religious processions, which are very different from the liturgy, which is bounded to a sanctuary and is more of like something um, um, inward or like contemplative, like limited to a certain context. This is the move from um, the liturgy to also to um, to protest, to like affirming ideas and not mm -hmm. doing the work of the liturgy, which is mm -hmm. not uh, affirming ideas. Like we've seen no, it. no, uh, the yeah. liturgies are not there to affirm yeah. ideas. They're yeah. there to worship God together yeah. as as God's people. And these That's type of point. processions were about affirming ideas. Yeah, I think I have a picture of yeah. one of them actually coming up in a second. So in response to all of this uncertainty about how you got saved and what you were supposed to do in church anyway, devout people generally gravitated towards popular devotions and they joined sort of pious groups as ways to assert their faith and as ways to receive the support of their fellow believers as well. Now, these popular devotions have sometimes been called para-liturgical devotions because they actually grew up in the shadow of the official liturgy of the churches. And they grew up without the sort of official ecclesiastical approval. As we saw uh, last week, the Roman Catholic Church published these uh, official liturgical books at the end of the 1500s. We tend to think, if we followed a religious course about the Reformation, that the Reformation was all about the printing press, that the Protestants really succeeded in mobilizing the printing press to disseminate their ideas. Well, it wasn't just the Protestants that were doing it. The Roman Catholics were doing it too. It was for the first time they could publish the Rituale Romanum, telling people exactly how to do the liturgy when to move, where to move, how to move, what to say, and try and impose it uh, on people. So at the end of the 1500s, any diocese, any Roman Catholic diocese, that had come up with its own liturgy for the communion service within the last 200 years were forbidden from using it. And instead, they were forced to use these particular books here that came out of Rome. There were some exceptions. Milan, for instance, had an older rite. Uh, Toledo, some dioceses in France that used the Gallican rite were exempt. Uh, some dioceses apparently, when they heard that this news was coming down the pike, decided quickly to adopt the Gallican rite and claimed that they'd always used it so they didn't have to use the Roman rite uh, that was being imposed on them. So anything that wasn't in these books, uh, whatever didn't find a place in these new worldwide Roman rite books, no matter how widespread it was, no matter how many Christians did it, it was considered to be non-liturgical. So let's look at a few of those things and see if we've got anything to learn from them. Here's one oh, of those processions. Okay. That's uh, yeah. exactly that. Uh, so here you can see, well, Joyce, tell us what we can see. Well, I guess it's a procession of the Ligueur in Paris, no? Yes. So like the Catholic yeah. party that we're having... Uh, protest also and that were uh, quite very excited and I mean a lot of them like joined uh, a lot of the fight against uh, the French Protestants and uh, the war atrocities too that were part of this yes. civil war you yeah. see like some monks here they are dressed with um, yeah. um, like weapons and everything yeah um, we can see guns and yeah, pike guns. staffs and yeah, yeah. swords and uh, all off in procession against the poor old Protestants. One of them is being biffed on the head over here by the look of it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting picture. Yeah. In the 1500s, these liturgical processions were sometimes practiced uh, to sort of compensate for acts that were thought to be sacrilegious. Here you've got Francis I on the left-hand side. These processions would take place 
to, uh, to compensate, say, for the destruction of a statue of Christ or the destruction of a statue of the Virgin Mary. Uh, Francis I there on the left uh, participated in one of these processions in 1528 uh, because of the desecration of a statue of the Virgin Mary. And seven years later, uh, he participated in another of these processions as, as a penitent himself uh, to make reparation for a Protestant poster that blasphemed the sacrament. Um, now, these processions, on the right-hand side, you can see uh, the sort of popular engraving of the flagellation of, of the king uh, to atone for the sins uh, of the people. Uh, to, to uh, desecrated the sacrament or done what have you. We'll look at that in a bit more detail in a second. Um, these processions very often involve carrying the blessed sacrament and any available relic that was around. Uh, we saw that in this picture here. Look, here's the blessed sacrament. Here are statues and relics being carried on the end of these long poles and what have you. Uh, uh, and the streets would be lined by people carrying torches. Yeah, yeah it's very interesting because, like this, this idea of like carrying around signs that you see now in, in most protests also comes uh, through this um, practices of carrying around relics and signs. And mm -hmm. I think that I've never read anything about that, but it would be a very interesting topic to study the importance of protests in France have to do something to do with that. That's very interesting. With religious yeah. processions, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. Fascinating origin to it. These are some medieval flagellants uh, here, or late medieval flagellants. Uh, some, some of these little confraternities of penitents would process through the streets. They would wear these hoods, sometimes to disguise their identity, uh, and they would flagellate themselves. You can see the flagellation things here, these little sticks with, uh, with chains sometimes, or ropes, uh, knotted ropes sometimes with thorns uh, put inside them uh, to, to beat yourself on, on the back. Um, the Jesuits, in fact, used the, this sort of piety of suffering in their revival missions. They went round as part of the Counter-Reformation uh, to revive faith in various different places in the late 1500s, early 1600s. And at the end of these missions, uh, the men would stay inside the church, flagellating themselves, uh, and outside the women and the children would be screaming for mercy from, from God, which is... Uh, one of the reasons that the Jesuits were rather distrusted in certain quarters, uh, not just amongst the Protestants either. Uh, the Jesuits uh, took a little while to get recognised. We generally tend to associate them with a rather, um, you know, the self-examination, spirituality, the examine and all of that sort of business. Uh, but they practised this uh, too. Uh, here's a procession of flagellants here, uh, and it became a rather popular mm -hmm. subject in art. Uh, also, not sure that these are Jesuits, however, uh, whatever else they, they, they might be. So you can see these penitential processions aren't exactly liturgy, uh, but they're more along the line of devotions, I suppose, and expressing themselves through political means, uh, polemical means against your opponent, saying, I'm willing to suffer more than you particularly are, taking on the suffering of Jesus into your own body as an act of penitence for, for blasphemy and the destruction of statues and what have you. Anything else to add to that, Joris? I mean, in this, in this society, it's too like the... The performance of violence is something you see all the time with like execution, the justice is way more uh, mm -hmm. violent uh, apparently because our justice is also violent in different ways but you see that uh, in the um, town square um, so this is also as to be this type of practices have to be seen in light of the global system of justice which is also violence mm -hmm. so when you're atoning mm -hmm. for something mm -hmm. if you want to actually show that you're atoning and you actually want to atone it you have to atone it also in ways that are kind of parallel to the way justice is atoning for mm -hmm. um, you know, like different crimes and everything so mm. I guess it 
It's interesting, isn't it? Because here in this picture, you've got this parent, presumably, yeah. uh, showing the children on yeah. purpose what's going on. That would be considered to be dreadful nowadays. You could be prosecuted for it. Uh, violence was much more of a daily reality. Um, no, hang on. Yeah. A more visible reality yeah. than it is today. Yeah. Today, we live in an equally violent society, but it's very often hidden and sanitized mm -hmm. and has its own liturgical practices around it. I have yet to hear of a gun massacre in the United States that has not been followed by somebody somewhere singing Amazing Grace. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. it's part of the way we atone. Yeah. Um, so it's not as if we live in a less violent society in some ways. No, not at all. Uh, it's just that we've sanitized it like so much else. Prisons and stuff. And uh, yes, stuck it in prisons or on the war, in, in, in the field of war. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Let's move on to a slightly different topic, and that is Marian pilgrimages. Uh, for centuries, uh, pilgrimages had been undertaken by Christians to give thanks, to express penance. You could go on a pilgrimage uh, as a form of penance, uh, ask for the intercession of a saint for a particular purpose. Uh, these pilgrimages were very much denounced by the Protestant reformers, uh, but they flourished in the 1600s and mostly to sites that are dedicated to the Virgin Mary. Uh, here in front of you, you've got the shrine to Mary at Loreto that, uh, that Thérèse of Lisieux famously visited in the passage that we heard uh, after our evening prayer. Uh, this shrine to Mary at Loreto, you can see here the, ex uh, the outside of the shrine and the parvis uh, of, the, of the church, it contained the holy house from Nazareth that had been miraculously transported there uh, by angels. Obviously, this isn't the house that Jesus was brought up in. Uh, they sort of fancified the, uh, the outside of it. Uh, here you can see they've sort of gone really baroque on it. Uh, but inside is the little holy house, uh, which is far more modest. Uh, there you can see the sort of flat Roman bricks uh, of the house and uh, the little altar inside it. Um, uh, it, it it was a hugely popular pilgrimage site, this. It was visited by Francis Xavier, uh, by Borromeo, the, the architect and artist. Uh, Francis de Sales, uh, Montaigne, visited it, uh, as did Emperor Ferdinand II of Germany, very famously. Uh, the Habsburgs loved it so much that they created a, an imitation of the Holy House. They built one of their own uh, for the Augustinian monks in Vienna. And in fact, the origin of the Oktoberfest is a pilgrimage to a Marian site. Uh, this is um, Altoting in Bavaria, in southern Germany. Here you can see the little church that was dedicated to Mary. Uh, and here I think I have uh, there is the, the Black Madonna of Altuting, uh, who is the, the focus of the pilgrimage, uh, made at, at the beginning of October. Uh, uh, people could belong to this pilgrimage society, and they promised to make a pilgrimage to Altuting once every four years. So it sort of guaranteed their trade, rather. Uh, and there on the right-hand side, you can see a, a slightly more close-up um, a picture of the church. It, ra uh, it snows a lot in Bavaria, which is why you've got these very steep uh, roofs to the churches and, and even to the houses, I think. Uh, here you can see it's a very cute place and uh, quite a wealthy spot because it's still a pilgrimage site. And of course, they get a lot of money from the Oktoberfest uh, mm -hmm. uh, as well. So these pilgrimages, especially to Mary, they didn't have a liturgy attached to them. There might have been a liturgy when you got to the pilgrimage site, but it would most probably be a mass. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't accompanied by specific prayers at certain points or spots along the way. Uh, this was more of a common devotional practice than a liturgical one that's taking place uh, outside these, these churches. 
Let's talk for a minute about the rosary. We looked at it when we did um, our spirituality course, but this was a medieval devotion that people would do in churches when the mass was going on and they couldn't hear what was happening or it was in Latin. Uh, you'd be able to do an easily remembered prayer and the rosary was one of them. We'll look at a few more in a minute. It really took off in the 1600s. You're probably somewhat familiar with the rosary. Uh, it's a petition of prayers in the form of a sort of mantra that, that, you, that you repeat over and over uh, with meditation on the selected mysteries of salvation. So there are three series of, of five mysteries and they're not all prayed at once. You choose which one you want to do. You can do the joyful mystery, you can do the sorrowful mysteries, or you can do the glorious mysteries. At the church I was at in Tottenham, we had a weekly rosary hour, uh, and obviously you do the sorrowful mysteries in Lent, and the joyful mysteries around Christmas and Advent, and the glorious mysteries uh, over Easter. Um, I always dreaded being on duty for the glorious mysteries because we've got the assumption of the Virgin and the crowning of the Virgin and I used to have to do extempore prayers on those things um, which sometimes was rather fanciful I have to say uh, but you follow them through you see uh, many of them are biblical the, uh, the Annunciation, the Visitation, the Nativity, the Presentation in the Temple when Jesus is 40 days old uh, the meeting uh, uh, in the temple with Simeon and Anna, uh, the sorrowful mysteries, obviously the agony in the garden, the scourging of Christ, the crowning with thorns, uh, the carrying of the cross and his death on the cross, uh, the glorious mysteries being the resurrection, the ascension, the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, uh, the assumption of the Virgin and the crowning of the Virgin and all the saints. Um, this, once again, is this a liturgy? It's a litany, I suppose. It's a set series of things. You're going to be repeating the prayers. You're going to be meditating on each one of them as you go along. Uh, but it can be done privately as well as publicly. It's not really the work of the people. It's more of a private devotion, although it can be used by a group of people at the same time. Uh, here's how it works, you see. You're supposed to say the Apostles' Creed as you're holding the cross. You then say an Our Father on the first fat bead, uh, and then three Hail Marys, a Glory Be on the string, and then uh, the first mystery, you begin with an Our Father, and then you start on the, I don't know, the joyful mysteries, and move round and say Hail Mary on each one of the ten Bs, a glory B on the string, and then the second mystery comes, and so you work all the way through with your one, two, three, four, five beads. Or one, two, three, four, five beads. Um, uh, the founder of the Dominican order, that is Saint Dominic, is credited with inventing the rosary. But it's probably a much, much older practice. People have used beads in prayer uh, ever since the dawn of time, really. These beads uh, survive even from the Stone Age. Uh, it's more likely that Dominic uh, did the most to promote the rosary, really, as a form of prayer and also as a form of instruction. Because you can see they all come in order. So if you pray them, you can remember the biblical stories here. So it's a useful exercise for that, uh, too. The, the mysteries themselves are this sort of comprehensive overview of the main events in Christian salvation history anyway, a sort of summary of the church's year as you go through, which is why you choose different ones at different times of the year. Uh, let's look now at the Stations of the Cross. Uh, here's Station 5 uh, in Jerusalem um, on the Via Dolorosa. The Stations of the Cross are sort of a series of stations, a series of halting places uh, in which uh, pictures or a tableau depicting scenes in the Passion of Christ become this sort of focus of meditation. Uh, here you have the fifth mystery. Here you can see the Roman numeral five. Uh, the, the fifth mystery, uh, mystery, the fifth station uh, is Simon of Cyrene taking up Jesus's, uh, Jesus's cross. Um, the origin of this practice 
of the Stations of the Cross probably goes back to about 400 or so. It's very old when Christian pilgrims to the Holy Land followed the way of the cross from the judgment of Pilate uh, all the way through to Calvary. So you can see here, uh, here's Haram al-Sharif, the, the, um, the, the Dome of the Rock, uh, and, uh, uh, the, or the enclosure of the Dome of the Rock on the site of the uh, temple in Jerusalem. And here is where it, it begins, where Jesus was um, uh, uh, condemned by Pilate. You then follow the Via Dolorosa, as you can see, wanders by the churches of the Sisters of Zion and the Arminian Church. Here's the Ece Homo Arch, where Pilate says, Behold the man, remember, at the end there. And then you can see each station of the cross is marked in, with a blue Roman numeral, and you can see what those stations are here down at the bottom in this little map. You can follow it on your own, or sometimes if you go on a joint pilgrimage to Jerusalem, uh, you will be encouraged to join a group of people who follow the Via Dolorosa. And here it ends up with the 14th station in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre at the site of the crucifixion, which used to be outside the city walls, uh, but now is well and truly within the city walls of Jerusalem. Just have a little look at the names uh, for a minute. Um, See how many of them are uh, biblical and which ones perhaps are not biblical that were invented by popular devotion uh, at various different periods. The number 14, incidentally, wasn't reconciled. They didn't come up with the number 14 until the middle of the 1700s. There used to be more of them. You've got Jesus condemned to death. Uh, by crucifixion by Pontius Pilate that's obviously in the Bible Jesus takes up the cross yes that's in the Bible Jesus falls for the first time I can't remember a specific fall although Simon, the cross got a little bit too heavy for him and Simon of Cyrene uh, took up the cross uh, Jesus meets his mother yeah, don't weep for me. Remember Jesus, the lamenting women? I think they come a little bit later on, don't they? Jesus meets his mother. Can't remember him doing that on the way to the cross. I think at the cross, yes, the, the, the Mary is present. Simon of Cyrene helps Jesus, yes. Veronica hands Jesus the handkerchief. Not in the Bible. <laughs> uh, uh, that's a, late, uh, a later story it might have happened don't know could have been an extra biblical story just because it's not in the bible doesn't necessarily mean it didn't happen uh, jesus falls for the second time okay um, jesus comforts the women of jerusalem yes that's in the bible jesus falls for the third time when we used to have to do the stations of the cross we used to hand them out and different people had to sign up to do a little talk at each one of these stations and that one was the one that was always the last to be chosen because everything's already been said when he's fallen first and fallen second. Uh, so that one often led, dropped in my plate if I, was, uh, if I was in charge of the Stations of the Cross during Lent. Jesus is disrobed. Well, yes, we can assume. Uh, Jesus is crucified. That's certainly in the Bible. Jesus dies on the cross. Yep. Jesus' body is taken down from the cross, that's in the Bible, and Jesus' body is laid in the tomb, that also is in the Bible. So you can see people have added to it and sort of added their own colour to it uh, in various different phases. Um, it's a sort of poor man's pilgrimage, if you like. If you couldn't afford to go all the way to Jerusalem to do this, uh, uh, you would be able to do it in your own church back home, uh, where you could set up your own stations of the cross. Uh, and as we can see here, uh, in this particular example, uh, you can buy kits even, or follow it online if you want to, and click between the different stations and meditate uh, on it. Uh, they can be followed by an individual or a group. You can follow them in silence and meditate in silence, or you can sing between the stations with or without texts. But once again, a specific text has never been set for the Stations of the Cross. Nobody's written a liturgy for it. 
There, there is a little liturgical antiphon and response at each of the stations. So as you move between the stations, there's a little sentence taken from the Good Friday liturgy. We adore your cross, O Lord, and praise your resurrection. And the people reply, for through the cross, joy has come to the whole world. The Stabat Mater was written uh, for it which was later incorporated into the official uh, liturgy of the uh, church. You might remember the opening of that, at the cross her station keeping stood the mournful mother weeping close to her son to the last. It's a, a hymn, if you look at the Stabat Mater, you can look it up online, you can find it in English or French or Latin if you want to. It's, it's a hymn of very individual piety. It's not a it's not a hymn that is intended to be sung as part of a common liturgy with everybody. It's the response of one person to, to the crucifixion. It's not really in keeping with, with a common prayer service. Um, it's interesting that the, the Way of the Cross has been championed in South America as a street procession uh, with stations practiced on Good Friday. So Maybe with the Catholic yeah. belief that Mary is the mother of the church and she mm -hmm. is the, the church in a certain extent too like mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I guess that this personal piety you, you can read the Stabat Mater also as the whole church being oh, there yes, attending yeah. uh, through her yeah. I guess. I don't, because Mary contained the body of Christ yeah. As, yeah. As, as the church is the body of Christ yeah. 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 and so wherever Mary sings or wherever Mary is there the whole church is present. Mm -hmm. But it's still a vehicle of quite personal yeah. attention and piety to it. Uh, so here you can see you can buy little cards of it and, and sort of do it on your own if you want. Sometimes they're a little bit s sort of um, sentimental, but you know, nothing wrong with that. Uh, let's... Um, but I'm not quite sure I got that in. Oh, the Stabat Mater. There she is. There's Mary at the foot of the cross, dressed in blue uh, with the other women. Joseph of Arimathea, is he here? This must be him. Look, he's got a wealthy robe on with this fancy purse that he's paid for the, uh, the, the tomb with. Uh, and here we can see John uh, mm. on the side. Yeah, maybe what we could insist on is like these devotional practices are also born out of the practice of liturgy and are totally woven in the biblical tradition like mm. because they are really grounded mm. in that which is quite different from a lot of modern so certain modern forms of liturgy that will be go coming down from ideas but when you see like why jesus fall three times well the three time pattern you find it mm. a lot in the bible there's mm. also like this idea of like the, the fall of adam mm. like, so he's reenacting this fall mm. with the cross here, like she's weeping by the tree, uh, the fruit mm. is taken down. So all this, uh, it's recalling, it's totally woven in. It's more of a, um, an acted continuation of the witness of the liturgy and of the biblical tradition than really creating something out of the blue. Yes, more like an extension yeah. of it's it that an, springs uh, yeah. from it. Yeah. And perhaps that says that the liturgy wasn't doing some of that yeah. or not being used for that. Or maybe meant maybe the liturgy produces that when it's a good liturgy. Yes, when it's a good liturgy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it sparks off those connections yeah. for people and invites people to create in this very mm. ingrained, uh, um, tied mm. to the practice itself. Mm. That's yeah. a good point. Let's have a little look at solemn benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. We looked last week at some Baroque altars and we discovered. Uh, that they were created to be a sort of plinth for the exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, and here you can see on the left and on the right uh, these very, very elaborate altars that are set up almost to be a monstrance. That is the thing in which the Blessed Sacrament is exposed rather than the place at which the communal table of the people of God so you can see on the left here, you've got this stand where the monstrance can be sort of set up 
uh, and here on the right too there's a statue here uh, but you can imagine the monstrance being set up here's the table itself uh, and the monstrance being set up here on this little plinth behind it now remember this this devotion this solemn benediction of the blessed sacrament this is the 1600s we're talking about it's the age of royal absolutism and and it reached this high point in the very long reign of king louis the 14th of france who reigned from 1643 to 1715 this is a throne for the blessed sacrament um, so comparable to the throne of the sun king is the, the throne of the king of kings in the tabernacle. So the natural instinct here when you pass it is to genuflect. Just as you would genuflect, bow the knee in the presence of the king. Uh, you couldn't approach the king without proper ceremony and without proper reverence and genuflection. Uh, so... Uh, it, the benediction refers to this uh, 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 a blessing that is that is done with the exposed sacrament we'll look at it a little bit more closely in a second um, it's got its roots as many of these practices do in the middle ages uh, devotions in the presence of the reserved sacrament took place after vespers or after compline and lay a was referring to that a little bit earlier on, uh, going to Vespers at three o'clock on a, a Sunday afternoon very often would be followed by solemn benediction. This is the case in a lot of Anglican churches too. Uh, uh, it's not just a Roman Catholic uh, thing. Um, at some point, somebody had the bright idea of picking up this pix or this monstrance uh, here uh, in which the sacrament is, is being kept and waving it over the people in a blessing uh, in the form of a cross uh, and this was also done in the corpus christi procession on the right hand side uh, you can see a simple corpus christi well simple nothing simple about that uh, uh, it, with just the papal what are they called the the swiss guard uh, a nice elaborate canopy over the top of it uh, the priest carrying the monstrance uh, with a cape you see you're not allowed to touch the monstrance while the host is inside it uh, so you have these sort of oven gloves sometimes that you you wrap yourself in the cape uh, before you grab the 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 monstrance uh, stalk uh, here at the bottom to bless the people with now occasions on which this blessing happened uh, it used to be just processions like this one uh, uh, but occasions on which the monstrance was used to bless the people uh, multiplied in the 1600s. So there'd be processions at Christmas, there'd be processions at Palm Sunday, at Easter, Pentecost, All Saints. If you dedicated a church, you would take out the first hosts that were consecrated there and process around the streets with them. Uh, at the coronation of a monarch, for instance, the, the solemn benediction would take place. If you gained victory in a battle, you would bless the people with the, with the monstrance. Uh, if you were delivered from a calamity or a disease, uh, you would bless the people with a monstrance. So perhaps we should buy one for the first um, in-person post-COVID uh, service in the church. Yes, I think this one would look very nice in Saint Esprit. It would be very in keeping with our modest, uh, with our modest sanctuary. Sometimes you can see they're extremely elaborate indeed. Here you've got, to, here it is, um, this is an outdoor monstrance. Here you can see the host uh, in the middle of the thing. This is a massive procession uh, which is going to culminate in the, uh, the blessing of the people with, 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 the, with the sacrament. Uh, some bishops in Germany, in fact, and in Italy complained that people were blessing their crops with the blessed sacrament. Uh, the, the, they asked the priest to come out with a monstrance and uh, wave it over their corn or whatever, a beetroot or whatever it was that they were growing. Um, this rite was standardised in the in early 1600s. It was more of a sort of spontaneous devotion, really, in its origin, but it developed a little lit liturgy of its own uh, in, the, uh, in the 1600s. What would normally happen 
was the monstrance would be put on the altar like this, and the first thing that would happen would be that the sacrament was incensed by, by the censor. You can see that's exactly what's happening in this little picture here. Uh, the censer is being swung three times three uh, at the Blessed Sacrament and then handed back to uh, the person who put it back on its stand over there. You would then sing Tantum Ergo, which is this old hymn, Therefore we before him bending this great sacrament revere. Types and shadows have their ending till the newer right appear. Um, that, that would be sung with everybody bowing, kneeling before the Blessed, uh, blessed Sacrament. Then a uh, little collect is read, uh, the collect uh, for Corpus Christi, and the body of Christ, the feast of the body of Christ, which was where this was taken out in procession. And then the people were blessed with the monstrance in the form of a cross, as I've said, uh, often on Sunday evenings. And here you can see the Pope doing the business uh, here with the, uh, with the Blessed Sacrament. I think that was last Easter, wasn't it, when nobody could take communion in person in Italy at the height of the pandemic there. And it was quite a moving thing to see under the circumstances how these ancient uh, traditions of the church uh, can be made to fit in with our contemporary, um, contemporary pickle. Uh, Let's talk now about something called the 40 hours devotion and perpetual adoration. Anybody heard of a 40 hour devotion before? This is a very sort of more Roman Catholic thing. I don't think it's come over really into the Episcopal Church. Perpetual adoration hasn't really come over. It's, it's sort of adopted in certain traditions, certain places. In the early 1500s, a priest in Milan preached a series of Lenten sermons. And during these Lenten sermons, he urged Christians to spend 40 hours in front of the reserved sacrament, uh, exposed in a monstrance like this, to seek God's help in time of war. And he recommended doing this devotion four times a year, at Easter, at Pentecost, at the Feast of the Assumption in August, and at Christmas time. So 40 hours devotion in front of uh, the sacrament that's exposed. He didn't say it had to be the same person doing 40 hours in front of it, unbroken and not going to the bathroom or eating anything. Uh, it would be set up in a church, rather like this, with all the candles burning, and people would take it in turns. If the sacrament is exposed in a monstrance like this and not hidden away in an ombre or in a pyx, it's forbidden to leave it alone. There always has to be a person present. Um, so this, this practice meant that different people could be present in the church during the 40 hours, but the 40 hours was, was supposed to be kept, that the sacrament couldn't be put away for a minute. There always had to be somebody present there for all of the 40, the 40 hours. Um, that devotion soon took off in churches. People could wander in and out. There was, again, no specific liturgy attached to it, no even specific, no prayers. You just turned up and prayed yourself on your own in, in front of it. And then this new element was eventually added to it. The reserved sacrament could be processed from church to church with 40 hours devotion in each place. So that this sort of ensured that there would be a perpetual adoration of the Blessed Sacrament throughout the year and lay people could sign up to take their turn uh, as part of this 40-hour devotion. Sometimes it could be extremely elaborate and these altars have been created especially for this purpose. Uh, you can see all of these candles lit here. The sacrament was to be exposed only on the principal altar of the church. If the church has more than one altar, you, you can't use a different altar for it. Any image or statue that is around at the time uh, of near the high altar has to be covered. So the only focus that you've got here is the sacrament, the, the, the host. 
Uh, relics all have to be removed from the high altar if you uh, uh, have the, ex the exposition of the, of the sacrament to avoid people from uh, giving their devotion to anything other than the presence of Christ in, in the host. And it's forbidden to hold any other mass in the church apart from the mass at the beginning and at the end of the 40 hours. So in churches where it was the tradition to hold a daily mass, if your church happened to be doing a 40 hours devotion, you couldn't celebrate communion while the host was exposed for the 40 hours on the high altar. It takes precedence over everything. And while the uh, sacrament is exposed on the altar, no bells are to be rung. All the bells are silent. Uh, we know uh, that in Saint-Cricœur has perpetual adoration, doesn't it, mm -hmm. over, over the city of Paris. Yeah. yeah. And it's never left alone. Yeah. Day or night, I don't suppose. Yeah. Is there a group of people who are dedicated to that? I think there's a congregation of nuns who, ah, right. who are there. Uh, yeah. But I think anybody can join. Uh, well, it's linked to the history of the Sacré-Cœur itself, which is quite polemical. Too. Yes, a little problematic. Yes. 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 Uh, yeah. Yeah. the oppression of the Commune de Paris and this idea that yeah. the Sacré-Cœur is built for the expiation of the sins of the Revolution and the, yes. and the Communes. And the Commune yes. of 1870. Yeah, 1870. Yeah. But maybe just to say one thing about... It's, it's very interesting to look at that when you put it also in the context of the time and when we talked about... Uh, the Reformation and how the Reformation has also changed the way and modernity has changed the way people relate to the Bible, to the church, to society, to themselves, that they are, they have the tendency to um, trust in like direct uh, uh, relationships to the power, like having less intermediaries and also trust in a form of power that's also overlooking them and they try mm -hmm. to enforce this overlooking by different ways I and mean, that's the birth of also the different forms of control that have to do with accepting to be uh, examined and have mm -hmm. examining others so when you have a look at this type of devotion and realize that this devotion becomes form of like totalitarian universal devotion that's mm -hmm. um, um, erasing all the other forms of devotion and even the communion itself yes it's quite yeah. interesting it kind of looks like the big brother big in, brother is watching in, you yes so, no that's, that's <laughs> really accurate with the light and and that's very interesting yeah. to see that there is the move of yeah. this yeah. the communion which is a, a f like eating a very like physical process to this um light it becomes just a sun. It becomes something really visible, something very uh, disincarnate, mm. disembodied. Yes, isn't that interesting? And disembodying. Take, yes, and disembodying. Because yeah. it prevents yeah. from other You're not. It's not there yeah. to be eaten. No. It's there to, for you to stare at and for it to stare at you. To, exactly. And to yeah. make sure you're all doing yeah. it uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. vigilantly yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah, there's a lot of control at stake with that. That you see in the Protestant tradition in different ways. Yes. the use of the word and yeah. the Bible who becomes this one authoritarian yeah. means of control and who is mm. looking at you all the time. Mm. And it's, yeah. That's such an interesting way of looking at it. Let's think about another one that generally tends to uh, upset Protestants a little bit uh, and that is devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus. Now, the roots of this devotion uh, go back to the Middle Ages as well, uh, uh, sparking in, in a sort of reverence or devotion to the wounds of Christ. There are various uh, saint, saints, uh, which saint is it? It begins with a B. Uh, she had these visions of a very bloody Christ on the cross with the blood sort of spurting out in every direction. And uh, uh, can't remember her name just at the moment. Anyway, that's very sort of medieval devotion to the, to the wounds of Christ. Uh, two monks uh, in France uh, elaborated these devotions to the wounds of, of Jesus and formalized them. One of them is on the left here. It's John Eudes, who was born in 1601. He died in 1680. And he wrote these uh, graphic um, books on the sufferings that Christ underwent on our behalf. 
uh, a bit like what's that the passion of the christ that film that came out uh, similarly sort of dwelt on the blood and the gore and the wounds and the suffering um, uh, and uh, Sister Mary Alacoque, she's on the right there, she died in, in 1690, so about 10 years after John Uday's on the left. She had several visions, uh, this lady, of the sacred heart of Jesus. And she said that in reparation for people's ingratitude for Christ's saving death on the cross, she was instructed in these visions to receive communion on the first Friday of each month and to spend Thursday night between 11 p.m. and midnight prostrate in prayer to imitate uh, Jesus' suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane. So this devotion to the Sacred Heart sprang out of devotion to the wounds of Christ uh, in the Middle Ages and once again it's become a formalized private devotion with specific instructions to receive communion on the first Friday of each month, to spend Thursday night between 11 and midnight uh, prostrate in prayer. So something that originated in a formless outpouring of, of private devotion has been sort of formalized by the church uh, and put in this sort of context of how you're supposed to do it. Is it a liturgy then, or is it not? Is it a, is it a formalized private devotion? And what's the difference between those things? As you can see, it's a very popular devotion even today. On the left, we have a rather blue-eyed Jesus pointing to his uh, sacred heart. And on the right-hand side, uh, you can have a tattoo. Uh, nothing to, is ever forgotten. Well, it's, a, well, it's an interesting motivation around that. Uh, but the, the Sacred Heart is a very popular tattoo in certain circles, isn't it? Are there birds on the side? Or? I think one of them is, uh, it looks like a fish here, <laughs> uh, a dolphin or something. And on the left-hand side, yeah, a bird, maybe. Well, <laughs> I, he's clearly had a vision too, maybe. It's, it's a shame he's not here to explain it to us, but uh, there are plenty of tattoos of the Sacred Heart uh, available for your perusal, uh, and uh, maybe you could get one once COVID is over. It's interesting to see that this devotion of the Sacred Heart, like the inner, innermost parts, like the, the inner parts of Jesus, uh, happen at the same time. After you have this um, um, devotion to the... Um, uh, Holy Sacrament that's mm. really looking at you. So there's this mm. extension of scrutiny mm. uh, to the innermost path, parts uh, at the same time as you have this mm. like very potent yes. light, light looking at you and yeah. transpersing you. Yeah, well, that's interesting, isn't it? Uh, let's talk about novenas. Anybody heard of novenas before? It's, it's got a very sort of Roman Catholic sound to it, a novena for this, that, and the other. Uh, Father Alphonsus Liguri, here he is, died in 1787. Uh, he was the son of Neapolitan nobility. And he founded the Order of Redemptrists, uh, who tried to sort of walk this middle path uh, between taking communion too often uh, and not taking communion often enough. The Jansenists were very strict about this. Uh, the uh, communion wasn't as uh, regularly practiced amongst the, the Jansenist movement uh, as it was in some other places. Uh, he wrote a little book, this man, here he is holding it, uh, called Visits to the Blessed Sacrament and the Blessed Virgin. And this was a hugely, hugely popular book, and it had a big impact on Roman Catholic uh, piety. It sort of recommended this sort of individualistic and emotional piety that centered really very much on private spiritual communion. Uh, the amount of preparation that Alphonsus uh, Liguri recommended in order to receive the sacrament worthily 
actually discouraged people from receiving the sacrament at all. It was so rigorous. And his piety that he encouraged in this, in this book was very much at odds with the celebration of the liturgy as a common work of people. It sort of privatized it. Uh, the prayers are actually quite short. They're not long. They go, Jesus, you gave yourself to me. I give my whole being to you. Now, that's not going to take 20 minutes to memorize. So people did memorize these things, and they would you know, go into church, attend to their own devotions during Mass, uh, instead of attending to the liturgy of the church. This little book, Visits to the Blessed Sacrament and the, Bless uh, and, and, and the Virgin, did a lot to make Roman Catholic services feel like they used to feel. That is to say, sometimes you would go along to them, or at least in my experience many years ago, uh, the, the Mass itself would be really fast. And people would be muttering away in their own pews or meditating away in their own pews. Uh, and it didn't seem as if they, would, they didn't sing very much. Sometimes they would respond if the, if the priest said, the Lord be with you or what have you. But it seemed as if everybody was more in their own world uh, than participating in something that was a bit more common, if that if that if I can put it that way, and I think uh, Alphonsus Liguri was was behind that moment that movement uh, uh, of uh, of private devotion during a public liturgy uh, in modern time, relatively modern times. Um, the novena was a sort of private or, or it could be semi-public devotion that was spread over nine days, hence novena. And he recommended that it should be done at certain times, like Christmas or All Souls Day. You would have nine days of, of these prayers. Uh, and some of these novenas, especially for the Virgin of Guadalupe on December the 12th, uh, here, here's an example. <laughs> the coronavirus novena, if you're short of a liturgical devotional practice just at the moment, have a little look. It's a novena asking for the intercession of several saints to come to our aid in the midst of the global crisis. Follow each of the specific daily prayers with the memori, uh, uh, memorare, uh, the St. Michael's prayer, which is a prayer against, uh, against Satan and all his works uh, for the defeat of, of Satan, St. Michael being the archangel, and a glory be to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So you've got St. Anthony the Great there, St. Edmund the Martyr, uh, the pandemic would end in a way that could only be attributed to your divine intervention. Nothing to do with doctors and mercy. Uh, St. Edmund the Martyr, patron saint of the victims of pandemics, pray for us. Then you've got St. Quirinius of Neus. I suppose that's how you say it. Anybody heard of him? Uh, uh, who saw miracles and converted that these miracles, patron saint of those afflicted by bubonic plague. Perhaps it's a good job we've not heard of him. Uh, then we've got Saint Luke, the doctor. Then we've got Saint Albert. Inspire scientists around the world with the needed solutions to the present crisis. Uh, patron saint of natural sciences, Saint Albert. So the scientists are in there. Uh, saint Joseph, why do we have to call on him? Uh, Oh, there's a patron saint of coffin makers. <laughs> so it's hot. <laughs> so not. Uh, it's uh, asking that we would see your churches reopen soon through the intercession of Saint Joseph. Catholic churches return to celebrate the Mass. Okay, right. There's probably a reason for that. Saint Matthew, global recession would be avoided. Of course, the patron saint of tax collectors. Uh, so he's being invoked against the economic effects of the pandemic. Then we've got St. Raphael, the Archangel of Healing, the Guild of St. Raphael there. And eventually on day nine, Mary, the Mother of God, uh, that the present crisis would end and the solution would reflect your majesty, Mary, patron saint of all humanity. So you can see the point of these novenas. This one is a, a, a novel coronavirus novena. You can see why each saint is being evoked on each day. Sometimes they're far more elaborate than this and take a whole lot more time. Uh, but it's a form of daily prayer for people. 
that, that spread over nine days. Now, one of the most famous of these is the Novena of Our Lady of Guadalupe uh, uh, on the tw uh, 12th of December. So obviously you're going to start your Novena on December the 4th mm. uh, so that you will end it on her feast day uh, here. Uh, on her feast day here you can, you've got the prayer for the feast of uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe. On each of those nine days you will have separate prayers perhaps to what was his name? The chappy that had the vision. His Juan. name escaped. Juan. Yeah, I can't remember his name just at the moment. Uh, but you can sort of work through each of those days prayer, praying with... What's his name? Sorry, Nita. Juan Diego. Juan Diego, Juan Diego, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, on the 12th day there, on, uh, on December the 12th, which is her feast day, another novena begins in Mexico. Uh, that is Las Posadas, uh, which is nine days of special prayer and devotion and preparation for the Nativity of Christ on December the 25th. And, and it, it enacts this publicly, the search of Mary and Joseph for a shelter. So it's a sort of moving novena uh, going round from place to place. But look what is happening. Um, as, did I have another slide, slide of that? Uh, here, yes, in this particular prayer, have a little look down. You can see Our Lady... Does it say it here, or was it on a different slide that I saw? Uh, ah, here we go. It starts with it. Loving God as Advent days continue. You see, they have to be reminded that they're in Advent and not in the season of Our Lady of Guadalupe. So many uh, the priests in Mexico and authorities in Mexico say, this, these whole novenas for this have taken over the whole season of Advent. We've lost a season to these novenas, to Our Lady of Guadalupe, and then to Las Posadas, and we've sort of lost track of what time of year it is, because mm. we've, we've sort of drifted away from Advent. Yeah. So, yes, Joyce? In Mexico also, like Our Lady of Guadalupe is really tied to national identity, and um, uh, it's really linked together. So it's also losing a little bit of Jesus Christ to this patroness figure, which is mm -hmm. uh, tied to Me a Mexican national Mexico identity. Mexican uh, national identity. Yeah, yeah that's it's interesting. Like the Me Mexican flag all over in like, the Guadalupe Sanctuary and all mm. of this. Mm. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's supposed to be a season where people are thinking about the second coming of Christ mm -hmm. and the, the ministry of John the Baptist and the Annunciation. Uh, and uh, it's, it's quite an interesting thing, the way these novenas sometimes become the focus of people's devotion liturgically as well as devotionally. Yeah. They, they can swamp it, swamp it out in some ways. Now... All of these devotions that we've been looking at, they've provided a sort of emotional expression of, of religiosity that was probably lacking in the official liturgies of the church, or, or at least in the way in which the church was performing those liturgies, that emptied of that sort of emotional content that we've seen. So all of these liturgies that the church was performing as, as these new uh, devotional things were, were happening, they, they, they appealed more to the head th than to the heart. And in fact, some of them that were practiced, like foot washing, for instance, on Monday, Thursday, veneration of the cross on Good Friday, the great Easter vigil service, all moments where, where emotion can be felt and expressed, they were probably observed in ways that didn't really engage the people. The liturgies were there in the church that could be used as vehicles for this emotion, very much so in the case, say, of the Easter Vigil, or the washing of the feet, or the, um, or, or the, the, or the veneration of the cross in the church on Good Friday. They were emptied of the, that emotional content, and, and all of that got poured into the novenas and the Sacred Heart and the exposition of the sacrament and the processions. Uh, 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 penitential processions and in the case of Protestantism 
They did away with those things. There was no veneration of the cross on Good Friday. There was no washing of the feet on Monday, Thursday. The, there was no Easter Vigil. Yeah, Nita. Yeah, I grew up in Mexico, and I have to say that I think that the, uh, uh, the feast of the Lady of Guadalupe and the Posadas and so on actually brought a far deeper experience of Christmas and so on than what we have up here. Oh, certainly. The, yeah. Because there was a whole, it was, it's a community expression and, mm -hmm. and people, uh, people um, felt a lot of, feel a lot of devotion, uh, devotion and so on. Yeah. Where, you know, with, with this, the same liturgy and so, and so on all the time, it tends to be sort of distracting and, you know, sort of the same thing and so on. Where here, mm -hmm. it's like it really drew you into something that was very profound. So I'm, I'm mm. sure the experience is different for different people, but I, 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 I can't say that, that it was less profound. Mm. And it was very much tied up with, with Christmas. Yes, with yeah. Christmas. Yeah. yeah. Las Posadas is really like a preparation of Christmas and, and reenacting, it's very Jesuit also, like this reenactment of um, uh, Mary and Joseph are looking for a place in the local community mm. to dwell. Mm. So it's really tied to these practices of very Catholic practices of like blurring the lines between mm. uh, the uh, biblical stories and the present time. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So we might think that some of these Catholic devotions are rather sort of intense the Sacred Heart, the flagellations, all of the whole business. Some Protestants might even think of them as primitive, sort of. It's too sort of immediate and messy. I mean, I'm not saying I think that, but I think for some people that's how the Sacred Heart might come over, at least, if, if nothing else, you know. Um, We've seen a little bit about how they arose from this need of expressing personal devotional piety, emotional piety. But what about Protestant paraliturgical devotions? Were they devoid of any emotional content, the Protestants? Were they the frozen chosen, as we say? Were they all up in their heads? Or did a paraliturgical tradition developed within Protestantism that expressed some of the same thing as you can see on the screen here uh, that is clearly very emotional. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you want if you want to have like a continuation of reflection on that you can watch the the study we did on reform piety and yes. nature and how it also develops some forms of devotions that also um, yeah take different shapes and are yeah. also linked to like the birth of modern science Yes, yeah. yeah. One of the aspects of it, of course. A another way to remember it is that, let's, let's just make a gross generalization for a minute. For Protestants, devotion was expressed less through the physical body and more through the mind. I know that's a very, very general thing to say. But the way to the mind is through hearing, through listening. And faith uh, uh, comes from what is heard, you know. And what is heard in the Protestant world, at least, is very often sung. One of the things that you might have noticed is that these paraliturgical traditions that we've been talking about within the Roman Catholic Church have not mentioned popular hymns. Because there weren't any. There was the Stabat Mater, yes. And there were great mass settings, absolutely. But people didn't really gather together uh, to, to sing hymns in the same way. Till a little bit more recently. Joris? I think in Mexico, I mean, I, the context in Mexico is that there are a lot of songs associated to these different pilgrimages. And there are also a lot of songs, I think, which are canticles and actually canticles in uh, like uh, vernacular languages mm. used in these paraliturgical settings because the, for a very long time the mass was in Latin. So these paraliturgical settings or like these devotional settings were a place where people could experience some form of like canticles, like in, during the processions in Brittany it was also that. Like mm. you would have canticles mm. in Breton 
for mm. uh, these festivals mm. that you wouldn't have so much in the mass itself. So right. in the West, there's the creation of this binary because the mass remains in the language that's not understandable for the people. Whereas mm. in, the, in the East, because the language of the liturgy is most of the time understandable, mm -hmm. um, you, you don't have this binary that's created. Mm. I mean, it's one of the aspects of the binary, but that created the divide that when we come across uh, and like became even more um, um, divided with the, the schism of the West between Protestant and Catholic. And Catholic, and, yeah. yeah. But it's certainly true that in a Catholic mass, there wouldn't be popular hymns sung no. by all the people. No, it's mostly part of processions, I think. Yeah. And but uh, I mean, for for yeah. I mean, thinking about uh, within the Protestant tradition, the the the, the, the hymnal tradition of the yeah. Protestants, the, the people have their favourite hymns. Mm -hmm. They 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 have things that they they sort of learn off by heart uh, from when they're children, and sometimes they can have very very emotional content to them. So it's not as if Protestantism is devoid of emotion. No. It's just expressed through other vehicles mm -hmm. than, than devotion to the Sacred Heart or... But it's very or, interesting to see that in the, the Catholic rosary. Church, in the vernacular language, there is not much tradition of liturgical hymns, whereas mm -hmm. they exist in Protestant tradition. There are hymns and canticles um, for um, like saints in the vernacular, yes. uh, special occasions like this. Sometimes Christmas is also a period yes, when you have Christmas. a lot yeah. of uh, song in the vernacular. Um, yeah, mm. that's yes. certainly true. Yeah, yeah. and I, I remember when we went on pilgrimages in England to Walsingham or somewhere, there, there was always special hymns sung, and people would sing them in the bus on the way and everything. It must have been a, a long-running tradition too. Uh, but it's uh, that sort of music seems more paraliturgical, it's totally paraliturgical. rather than liturgical as yeah. it would be the case yeah. in a Protestant church. Yeah, and the introduction of like the last uh, f uh, French uh, Catholic hymnal really says that what you're singing in church cannot be chansons, cannot be songs. Yeah, uh, it cannot be um, this type of like. Uh, like it cannot be La Guadalupana that you sing in church basically right. it says it's fine to have this type of se of, of songs uh, like religious songs but not during the not mass not during the mass right it has to be about the liturgy of the mass yeah. that's interesting well those were the practices I wanted to look at and I wanted to finish by asking a couple of questions really uh, first of all why do we think liturgy and private devotion uh, have split off from each other so often in Christian history. It's, it's, it's not just an isolated phenomenon at the end of the medieval period. It, it's happened all the way through Christian history. Is this because liturgy doesn't lend itself to emotion? Or is it because the church has been too controlling? Is it because people don't really want to express their emotions in public and it's not possible to do it through, through, through a liturgy? But to finish with, uh, Joris is going to lead us in a prayer. Vous tous, bénissez le Seigneur, vous qui servez le Seigneur, qui veillez dans la maison du Seigneur au long des nuits. Levez les mains vers le sanctuaire et bénissez le Seigneur. Que le Seigneur te bénisse de Sion, lui qui a fait le ciel et la terre. Que le Seigneur Tout-Puissant et Miséricordieux nous bénisse et nous garde, le Père, le Fils et le Saint-Esprit. Amen. Amen.